Hello and welcome to my tutorial on Circuit Maker. My goal in this video is to just get you started with Circuit Maker and get you to where you can create a basic board design. Before starting this video, you need to make sure that you install the Circuit Maker software and have an account with them so that you can log in and do your work. Once you have those two things, come back here and we'll get you started. The first thing to do is to create a new project. So I'm going to go to File and create a new project. I'm going to name this project Tutorial. Click on Create. And then wait for it to catch up here. You've created your project file, but there's no documents inside of it. So the first thing we want to do is create a schematic. Right click on Tutorial, go to Add New to Project, and select Schematic. You can name this anything you want. I'm going to leave it as Sheet 1. Here's the schematic view. In the bottom right, you have the place where you can put some information about who's creating this, the date it was created. So, for example, I could go in and select a text string up here and then put it into the title and then right click to deselect. You can also press escape to deselect the current tool. And then I'm gonna double click on this to get into the properties editor. And we'll name this tutorial. I don't usually fill anything in down here for my projects because it's not really important for me. But if you're working with other people, it's good to have something uh, recording exactly who did what. Now let's get our first component. My goal for this project is to create a breakout board for a surface mount package device. Let's go get that device from the library. Now I've already gone and searched around a little bit, so I know that if I put in 74HC245, I'm going to find that there is an HC245 device. However, the PW package or the TSSOP package is not available. See at the bottom, there's no symbols present, there's no footprint, so I can't use this one. Instead, I'm going to use the LVC version of this same function. And it looks like this LVC245 in the TSOP package is available. You can see down here that it has a symbol, and if I click on this uh, footprint viewer, you have to wait a couple seconds, but it'll load up the footprint. We can see that a footprint was created and that should be good enough for what we're doing. To place this, I'm going to right click and select place. And then you can move your mouse away from the libraries tab. And then you can place this into the middle of the screen. You can continue to place these as many as you'd like, but I'm just going to right click to cancel. I still need two other components. I need to get a header that I'm going to use to break this out. And then I'm going to get a capacitor for bypass. Going over to the library, I'm going to type in header 2.54 millimeter, which is a 100 mil spaced header, and 10. Let's see if we can find a 10 position header to use. Scrolling down a little bit, it looks like this might be what I'm after. Yep, there's a 10, or that's only eight. I need 10. I found a 10 pin through hole device that's going to fit. Uh, the majority, which, what you see is uh, the breakaway headers most of the time are gonna be 0.1 inch space. That's the same spacing as a breadboard. And my goal here is to be able to plug this into a breadboard when I'm done. So let's go ahead and grab this component. Whenever I place this, I'd like pin number one to align with pin number one on the device. It's not actually necessary, but just to show you how this works, you can press X to mirror horizontally. And I'm going to go ahead and place this here. And then you can press X again to mirror it. And I'd like pin one now to go down to pin 11. So I'm gonna press Y to mirror vertically. 
If you want to just rotate, you can use the space bar to rotate around. Left click to place it, and now I don't need any more of this, so I'll just right click. There's one more component I wanted to place, and that's my bypass capacitor. So I'll go back up to libraries. I want a capacitor that is 0.1 microfarads and preferably in an 0603 package, something that's relatively easy to solder. The first one that comes up already has a footprint and a symbol, so I'm happy with that. Right click, choose place. Press escape to get out of that. Now I'm going to zoom in. Uh, once you're zoomed in here, you can hold control and zoom in. You can also go to view and change your zoom level, zoom in and out. You can zoom to the full document. I like to use the shortcuts, control and mouse wheel zooms you in. Then you can use your mouse wheel to move up and down. Shift and mouse wheel moves you left and right. And you can use your right mouse button to grab the page and move it around. I find this to be the most convenient and most intuitive to me is just right clicking and moving things and then using control to zoom in and out. Now to wire these up, the easiest way would be to place them together and then pull them apart. In order to place a wire manually, you can go up to the home tab, click on wire, don't click on wires here because this is the filtering of your page rather than the selection. I've clicked on these many times by mistake. We go to wire right here and then we can place a wire. So we're going to go from pin 20 to pin 10 right there. And we can wire these directly across relatively easily. Now, what if you had one of these that you wanted to wire up and it was not so easy? Well, I'll show you a trick for that too. Within the same sheet, as long as a net is named the same, then they will be electrically connected together. So this capacitor up here, I want to connect to pins 20 and 10 so that my ground and VCC are connected to this capacitor. I'm just going to place little stub wires on here for a place to put my net names. You left click once and it will continue to allow you to place more wire. And if you right click, it'll get you out of that. You have to right click again to get out of the tool entirely. Now I want to put a name onto this wire, so I'm going to choose net label. And you can see I've already been doing something like this, so P20 is the name that I've been given. By default, I believe it just says net or net name or something like that. You can press tab once you've selected this tool. So you open the net label by either pressing N or clicking on net label. Then you can press tab and it'll bring up the inspector. You can type in the first value you want to go to. So I'm going to use P1 and press enter there. And now I have P1 for my connector name or my net name. Whenever I click here, it's going to go forward to P2 and it'll keep doing that. It'll advance through as long as you keep clicking on nets. And this is really handy whenever you want to name a whole bunch of pins that are sequential. Now I want to name this side of the capacitor to ground and this side to VCC. It doesn't really matter which is which. But I'm going to just copy with control C and then control V. I'll paste in the net name there. And same thing here again, P20. You don't have to copy paste. You can just rename them to be the right pin name. Uh, that's another way to do it is to click on it after you've selected it, uh, you just click once and then wait a second, just like in Windows, you can do that with file names. Now we have our schematic. This is a very, very simple board. I'm using pre-existing components. If you wanna learn how to make a component, there are some really good videos out there I'd recommend watching. In fact, I'll try to put some in the description below. I usually have to refer back if I'm going to make one because there are a lot of steps to make a really good component if you want to have a 3D model and if you want to have all the correct layers involved. If you're not doing it all the time, definitely recommend reviewing before making one. Now that we have our schematic created, we can go over to, uh, first I'm going to save this top left. Then I'm going to right click on tutorial and add a new document called PCB. 
I'm going to leave it as the generic name. Let it catch up to me. Now I've got my PCB and there's nothing on it. If I look around here using the same right clicking method as before, there's nothing here. So what did I do wrong? Nothing wrong at all. This is exactly the way it's supposed to work. We're going to go ahead and save this. I'm going to go back to my sheet, which is the tab here. And then I'm going to go to project and update PCB document. Whenever you click on this, it'll bring up the engineering change order window. And a lot of the time this window will come up much smaller. You can expand it out to see everything in it and it should remember your setting. You can see that it's going to add four components, 20 nets and one class. Classes are something I've used in Altium, but I've never really used in Circuit Maker. If I learn more about those, I may make a video about it later. But for now, just know that they're being added to your board. We're going to hit validate changes. You can see that everything was checked and it's all OK. Execute changes. And now our board has been updated to have some components. They're always placed off to the bottom right of the board, so they're not actually on the board. Before I get started with placing these onto the board, the first thing I want to do is set my grid. For roughly positioning things, I like my grid size to be 100 mil. And the 100 mil grid is also what size breadboards are built on. So that will help us out. J1, I'm just going to go ahead and drag all these over. You can select all of them just by dragging across like that. And we'll go ahead and zoom in here. Now you can see that these components don't actually snap to the grid lines. I prefer these circles to be directly on the grid line. So I'm actually going to change my grid again to 50 mil so that I can bring this down one point. Hey, cut that out. There we go. And uh, my capacitor is going to go right on top here. If you zoom way in, you can see that your pin names are actually on the pads. The P10 goes to my ground, P20 goes to my VCC, and you can see these little lines connecting things. These are what are going to tell you which nets go to where. So if this thing had been backwards, you'd see how they cross, and you can just press spacebar, select the part so you're moving it, then press spacebar twice to rotate it around. You can see that J1 is backwards because all of these nets are going to the wrong sides. So I'm just going to select this right in the middle here so that I'm holding on to it. Press space twice again. And now I've got that. Looks like everything is connected up pretty nicely. All I got to do is run my traces. I'd like my board to align to a breadboard and uh, whenever you look at a breadboard, it's set up with 300 mil or 0.3 inches of space between the center two rows. That would look something like this. So we have there's dead on each other. That's 100 apart, 200, 300. So this is how far apart those rows are. We're not really going to be able to fit our TSOP part in between that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go two more rows, one and two. And I can check this by going over to the grid of 100 again, so I can see the lines a little easier. So there will be an empty row in between, but that's not a problem. I'm going to switch back to 50 mil and put this right in the middle. Now, it may be a little tight to wire this up the way it is right now. I've got pins five and six right here. Those wire straight in. This will go to that wire, this will go to there, and this, this pin I'm a little worried about. Let's see how it traces out, and we'll decide if we want to move it or not here in just a second. Before I get started with running traces, I'm going to go ahead and fix these gigantic designators. If you hold shift while you select them, you can select more than one designator, and then on the left in the inspector, I'm able to go in and change the height of the text. So I'm going to change that to half as high, 30 mil. And when I do that and press enter, you can see they all get shorter, but they also get fuzzier because the thickness of the line is still 10 mil. I'm going to change that to 5 mil. And these are the settings I like to use for my designators. 
put J1 there, put J2. In fact, I want to put J2 down by pin one of J2. We have J1, J2, and then we have U1 and C1. Honestly, on a board this simple, you don't need the designators, but just for the sake of showing it, this is what I would do. I'm not actually setting my board shape yet. You can see I've still got this huge board and that's because I want to see if I'm going to be able to trace this out or not. So let's go ahead and start running some traces. Uh, under home, you can go to route or you can press R for route. And the first thing I'm going to do is actually change my grid. My mistake, go to snap grid 10 mil. This gives me a more accurate uh, movement of those traces. I press R again to get back into that mode. So I'm going to run this one straight out to here and this one straight out to here. And those look OK. So those are right in the middle. That's as good as I can get them, I think. Next, I'm going to run this and I'm going to run it a little far away because I want to make room to be able to run the next trace. So far, I haven't changed any rules. But there is one important rule you're probably going to want to change here. So let me run, let me run a separate trace here. I want to run VCC to this capacitor. And when I do, I'm going to use a thicker trace. So I want to change this to 14 mil. Oh, it didn't change. So why not? Uh, this is because I have a rule set and it's a default rule in the system but it's saying that I can't make a trace bigger or smaller than 10 mil. In order to change that from the home tab, we're going to go up to design rules. And there are a whole lot of design rules. This is what basically keeps you from making big mistakes on your board, accidentally letting things run over each other or get too close together that might make a short. For the routing width, I can get down to about five mil with the board house I like to use, which is JLC PCB. And the maximum width I might use is say 32 mil. I'll still keep 10 mil as my standard preferred width, but press okay down here. And now whenever I go in to make a trace from my VCC pin up to there, you can see it's already updated to 14 mil. On the left-hand side, it says width 14 mil. And that's because I tried to change it to that a minute ago and it remembers it just wouldn't let me do it because the rule said 10 was the only number allowed. So now we can run that there and let's go ahead and finish running the rest of these traces. Now you can see that that's 14 mil and I don't actually want 14 mil right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and run that all the way, press escape, get out of it. You can see that there's an error here. It's indicating that I'm violating a rule and I'm getting too close together. We zoom in, it says there's less than 10 mil between these two traces, which is that's being very generous really to the board houses. Most board houses can get accuracy to five or even less, but in this case, I'm going to go ahead and select this entire track. Every time you click on something that is ambiguous, it thinks you may have clicked on one thing or another, you're going to get this little menu that pops up and asks you which one you wanted. This happens with left clicks, right clicks, double clicks, any type of click that is going to bring up a menu for something, it's going to ask you which thing you meant. So I'm going to grab that one. Then I continue to hold shift to select these and I'm going to go over to my inspector now directly without pressing anything else and I'm going to change these to 10 mil. Press enter and now you can see there is 10 mil between these and it's not complaining anymore. So it looks like I'm just barely able to fit the right number of traces in here. Really these are spaced about as close as you can get. You can get a little closer like I said. Uh, but within the rules that I currently have set, I wouldn't be able to do much more. Now it's defaulting to 14 mil again. I'm going to switch to 10 mil now, and we should see that change as my default whenever I go to the next trace. Yep, there it is. I want to run down over here, make some room for that next trace, right? 
and do the same thing here. The remainder of the traces, I'm just gonna run real quick. You can run these any way you want, really. I prefer to keep things symmetric, nice looking, and try to keep them spaced evenly apart. I also want to, yeah, I wanna avoid these kind of issues where things are too close together. So uh, let me show you another way to fix this now, where these two have gotten too close together because I just didn't have an option. I couldn't really make this come out any sharper than I already did. And in fact, this pin is now gonna be problematic because of this one. What I can do is I can grab this and just pull it away. So you just left click, hold it down and drag it away and it will automatically adjust. Now I can pull it all the way into that other via in Altium, it'll actually fix that, but in Circuit Maker, it does not. So I'm gonna just pull this over uh, pretty much as far as I think I can. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with this one, pull that over. And that gives me enough room to be able to place the next track. And now I can just run down to here, pin 12, and I'm done with that. There's only one thing left that I need to connect and that's gonna be the ground. So I'm gonna run this out. I'd like to have a little bit lower impedance to this bypass capacitor. So I'm going to hit tab and put in a 14 mil, just like I did with VCC. So I'm just gonna run that right up there to the capacitor and I'm going to continue my routing at 10 mil again by pressing tab and typing in 10, pressing enter. You might think that 10 mil traces are not big enough to be able to drive current for your application. And that may be the case because there are limitations to 10 mil traces, but you might be surprised to hear that you can run up to one amp of current through these 10 mil traces without any problems. For my VCC trace, instead of running it from here, because I have the capacitor up here, I'm gonna go ahead and just continue on that 14 mil trace all the way up to the VCC pin. It's a little bit inconsistent, but that's gonna be fine. Everything's wired up. And you know what? I kind of, uh, to be consistent within my own board, I'm gonna just change this to be 14 mil. So now we have our part wired up. Everything looks pretty good. The last thing I need to do once I have everything set up the way I want it is to change my board size to match my layout. This is very easy in this system. All you have to do is on the home tab, click on board shape, redefine the board shape. Now I prefer to do this with a grid of 100 mil, which I forgot to do. So I'm gonna right click to cancel, right click again, go to snap grid and choose 100 mil. And I'm gonna just make the board outline right around the edges here. Go to board shape, redefine board. And now all I have to do is follow the grid, left click on every one. And when I'm done, right click, and that completes it. If you press three, you can get a 3D view of your board. Assuming there are 3D models available, you can take a look at every different side of your board. On your number pad, there are a few different shortcut keys that are very helpful for this. Pressing the one key will give you a front on view of your board. Pressing three will go to the side, seven goes to the other side, and nine will flip to the back of the board. Getting back to the front is one. You can also rotate around with four and six, and eight and two. To get back to your 2D view, you just press two and you can do that from any view. So for example, if we were looking at it like this and we press two, it'll snap right back to our 2D view where we can go and edit our board. Now, in order to get this board built, you're going to have to go through some instructions to export the Gerber files. 
that's going to be all the different layers. If you look at the bottom here, we have the top layer, bottom layer, the outline layer, which some board houses are gonna require. You might have to draw lines in there. So up here you can see there's a line and you can draw that on any layer. So if I wanted to draw the edge of my board, I could just go around and do this. And now I have the board outline actually as a layer on my Gerbers. Each one of these layers will come out as a precise drawing that will be used to create your board. Typically, you're only gonna need the top layer, bottom layer, the outline, and top overlay. That's where all of the drawings are going to be. Bottom overlay, you can have that same drawing layer on the bottom of the board. You can also put on solder paste. Uh, that helps you with making uh, stencils to be able to put on surface mount components. Whenever you go to a board house to get your board built, they'll typically have instructions on how exactly to get what they need from your software. So I'm not going to go into the details of that. You can follow the instructions for your specific board house. If enough people are interested, I might make a video on how to do it for JLC PCB, which is who I use for most of my boards. JLC PCB is cheap and easy to use. You've probably heard their name from sponsorships from other channels. I am not currently sp sponsored by them, but I still use them. Uh, I think I usually pay less than $20 to get five copies of my board uh, shipped relatively fast. Usually it takes a month or two to get them because I believe they're in China. Now that I'm done with my project, I'm just gonna save everything so that we don't lose anything. And then I'm going to quit out of here. Thanks for watching and good luck on your own projects.